right, thank you everyone for joining uh, the first uh, sponsored session. So this is gonna be a session sponsored by Medtronic and kind of covering the newer generation self-expanding platform up to the FX and basically looking at technical optimization for common clinical challenges. So hopefully in this, we'll talk about some of the pre-procedure planning issues, um, TAVR, some obviously much of that has been discussed in the morning. Hopefully a couple more points of interesting discussion. Some of the issues about valve choice and challenging anatomies um, and uh, some of the issues with optimization, both with traditional self-expanding valve and, uh, and uh, also uh, using the FX system. Um, so joining me on the panel is Dr. Khalid al Mirri and uh, Dr. Wasim Shatila. And uh, presenting the case will be my partner at uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, Ahmed Hakmi. So we'll just go ahead and dive into the case. So during the case, we'll have a few stop points for discussion. I'll ask the panelists, but of course, anybody from the audience has any input or questions, we can, uh, we can stop there as well. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Imad. Uh, it's a pleasure being here among such experienced colleagues. Um, we're just going to share a case, and uh, across this case, we're going to have some um, question pauses to see what, uh, what variations in practice we, um, across the different institutions. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, our patient is 83-year-old, um, very delicate female, 33 kilograms, very small body surface area, who have multiple admissions for heart failure, basically. Um, uh, cardiac history is significant for uh, complete heart block, for which she had a lilitus pacemaker uh, a year ago. At that time, she had a cardiac cath, which did not show any coronary artery disease, obstructive coronary artery disease. She has a pretty advanced uh, CKD with a GFR of 10, creatinine of 380, and she's not on dialysis yet. Uh, she follows closely with uh, our renal service. Um, exam, significant for uh, systolic murmur across the aortic valve area. Medications, pretty simple. Medical regimen, just dedicated for hypertension. Uh, her EKG, as we see, she has a right bundle. Otherwise, sinus rhythm, X-ray, a little bit congestion, some small pleural effusions. And these are her labs with uh, severely elevated BMP and uh, anemia from chronic uh, disease. This is her echocardiogram. Um, as we see, she has a good EF, the usual uh, thick ventricle, small cavity for all the uh, tiny ladies with um, severe MAC, like we noticed on the mitral valve and uh, severe, uh, severe restriction of the aortic valve leaflet motion, as we see. Uh, not a lot of MR, not a lot of AI. Uh, however, her aortic valve is uh, severely stenotic with a mean grade in the 40s and uh, calculated area around 0.5. And as we see on the cross section there, she has severely restricted leaflet motion and overall a small annulus uh, as we notice. So this is the summary so far. As we said, we have a, a, an old trail lady uh, with pretty advanced CKD, not on dialysis yet. Um, who comes with multiple admissions for heart failure. Um, uh, MDT discussion, uh, the patient was deemed non-surgical um, uh, as expected because of her frailty and age. Um, and the discussion highlighted the concern for contrast-induced nephropathy and risk of hemodialysis um, with any kind of workup we do uh, for TAVR planning. <clears throat> so I think this is a good uh, discussion pose here. And the focus will be in what is the workup protocol that you have at your center uh, for such scenarios where you have severe AS um, for a TAVR candidate uh, with, with pretty uh, poor renal function. Okay, so that's a good point. So I'll start with Dr. Khaled. So we get these patients. You probably get, you know, people in our region are deathly afraid of dialysis. Give them anything else, but dialysis is no. So, but you get a patient who so you're working up for TAVR, GFRs 10 to 15. What do you do? Do you say get the CT no matter what, and with this data that venous contrast is not at, is not the same as arterial contrast? Do you use a lower protocol CT? Do you just do the chest and do some ultrasound peripherally? Do you do TE and non-con? What's your protocol at your center? Yeah, in, in this patient, the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy is is really high, um, and the question is what information that we need. Um, if we can get it without contrast, I think that's the way to go. I think we can do that with the TE to evaluate the annulus, amount of calcium, but the axis will not be able to, to evaluate. The height of the corners we're not going to evaluate. So I think we can still 
get that information with non-contrast CT. So with non-contrast CT, you can have an idea about the size of the vessels, amount of calcification, the periphery, and you can have an idea about the height of the corries <clears throat> and the amount of calcifications as well and the sinus uh, size. But I would do <clears throat> TE and then contrast CT. We'll see much of that. So um, we've actually had um, a lot of frequent encounters with similar scenarios. So we're doing TE also sizing. We've had some issues with certain um, valve companies who were refusing TE sizes actually and insisting on CT. Uh, guided uh, sizing. So this we had those issues with, but from uh, our standpoint, we're still insisting on TE if we had such a low GFR. But with a higher GFR, when it's, where it's borderline GFR above 30, we are sometimes uh, talking about the risk with the patient and going ahead and doing the CT. And with all the patients we've done so far, the creatinine has actually remained stable with no change. So what do you guys do when you do the CT and there's bad calcium? <laughs> What's that, sorry? Bad peripheral calcium. Lots of calcium in the peripheral vessels. Then what? So, uh, see, sometimes, or most of the times when we avoid to do CT with contrast as pre-procedure, we end up by getting more contrast during the procedure to get more information. I, I think, I believe, in, in if we just do proper CT with contrast, a small amount, save your contrast during the procedure. So if you have calcium, you just, you know, do the procedure, evaluate the groin during the procedure and have your uh, tools to, as what we have said in the last, or seen in the last session, your tools ready, balloons, shockwave balloons, and try for the best. Anybody have uh, experienced CO2 and geography? We kind of experimented with that maybe like four or five years ago. Anybody do that or? We did it earlier, but we haven't been doing it recently. <laughs> it seems like it's kind we of We tried it. Yeah. And while like we see the images in the, in, on paper, they look really nice. But when you used it, um, the images are not really great. Maybe Awaid has has a, a experience in that. So we, we always do the CO2 when patient has CKD going for peripheral vascular interventions. But preparation is important, like the... Uh, uh, the hold the, uh, the cooperation to hold their breath. If he's in conscious sedation, it's better give him put him in general sedation with laryngeal mask to stop the breathing. Um, the also sometimes we give uh, the, uh, uh, the, the met, not metoclopramide uh, before the uh, the to uh, reduce the peristalsis. Um, uh, there is a, the uh, this. A device special special for CO2 injections instead of the old days when we do it with the with the um, the, the uh, Foley's bag uh, now just a machine and just inject the proper volume with the proper pressure. The images are crystal clear. So especially in the iliac, crystal clear. Abdomen they have to hold their breath. When I said it's not really great, we did it for the renal arteries. To be frank with you. We wanted to test it on a renal denervations. Uh, we didn't like it. Maybe patient was breathing. So those are great advice. Like everything, if you do it regularly, you get better at it and image better. Just in terms of contrast, contrast CT, you guys do only systolic phase. So you can escape with a 40 or 30 CC contrast CT. How bad is that? Like in terms of kidney, like we've done it for cases with a creatine of 300 and you just gave it hydration for a day or so. so I think like it's an overkill to do no contrast completely, unless the patient preference or there is severe allergy or something like this. But 30 cc of contrast, you're gonna end up giving way more for an LV gram or the aortogram at the end of the case just to check your access, just because you are worried you are not seeing the whole case. Okay, so I might want you to go ahead no, and say I mean, what you did. I mean, fantastic points. Um, the, the purpose of this discussion, obviously, is to highlight there's more than one way of doing things. Uh, all the points you guys mentioned are completely valid. And we actually do different things across different patients. Um, this is one example uh, of a situation where we utilize certain pathway. And as mentioned already, there's one way of measuring the annulus using the TEE and uh, getting a non-con uh, to evaluate the vessels grossly, not finely, I would say, um, with, with clear um, uh, deficiencies in that approach. 
there's an approach of obtaining uh, using uh, utilizing an MRI without contrast. Um, sometimes that adds value and can also assess the annulus, but it, it's highly operator comfort dependent. Depends on the institution, your radiology colleagues, how comfortable are they with evaluating the annulus of the aortic valve and how much uh, concordance you get between the MRI and the CT in your institution this also. And there's the other point mentioned of just getting a plain, simple, low contrast CT scan. Uh, we're risking um, the, some uh, renal function decline. However, as already mentioned, the, the, the difference between intravenous contrast and intra-arterial contrast, there might be dif uh, different, uh, more forgiving actually intravenous than the intra-arterial. Uh, in this patient, we opted to go with the route of CT scan without contrast and the transesophageal echocardiogram to assess the annular uh, dimensions um, um, as the option of uh, choice. Understanding that if we have any concerns, then we might need to go with the route of actually getting a proper CT with low dose contrast. Um, um, we have um, our imaging colleagues um, uh, basically did multiplanar reconstruction at the annular level. They basically cut the annulus millimeter by millimeter going from the LVOT to the annulus to the sinuses and they give us really nice measurements and they give us uh, a comfort zone, I would say. They don't give you a, a specific number, they give you a more of a comfort zone of based on the measurements they acquire, they feel comfortable that the measurements are CNC. Uh, for example, this patient had a pretty small annulus with a measured area of uh, 270 millimeter squares and the perimeter of uh, 60 uh, millimeter and the diameters were between 20 and 1.6 uh, or 16, 20 and 16. Uh, so overall, small sinuses, small um, annulus, small LVOT, uh, and uh, these were the measurements that they felt comfortable providing us with. <clears throat> We got the CT scan without contrast, um, which in her case, at least, we, sometimes it's very helpful to get the calcium at closer to the annual level. Sometimes the patient has the calcium at the leaflet tips, so it doesn't help you much when measuring heights, but we felt comfortable with the heights of the coronaries, uh, the left main, the RCA. Clearly the sinuses were narrow as measured by the TEE. The STJ was also uh, in the range of 25. Uh, the heights of the STJ was low. We clearly see the calcium distribution there, um, uh, the right upper screen. Uh, we usually like to do um, like an estimate where we put a 23 valve, 23, 23 size valve and see how it fits in the sinuses or the annulus. Obviously significant um, uh, limitation in that approach, especially without the contrast. However, the CT here really showed us nicely that the calcium nodule that's basically present in the LVOT, especially below the left leaflets. Uh, extending into the mitral valve. Uh, peripheral vessels, as you see, um, on top of it, she had the right hip replacement, which gave us a lot of artifacts. You cannot really make uh, educated guesses from the right side. There was, you see some calcium. Uh, we felt relatively comfortable with the left femoral, uh, but we noticed that the patient had iliac calcification. Um, um, and this is a, a, a scan through the aorta where you see the patient has almost porcelain aorta, heavily calcified ascending aorta and arch, adding to the complexity of the procedure, the planning, I would say. <clears throat> so um, now we know this anatomy. I guess I can ask a question um, from, from everyone. Are we comfortable with, with the data we have to proceed with the TAVR or it would be nice if we know who would proceed actually with TAVR, who would actually go for a, um, an actual CT scan with contrast, knowing what we know now, um, who's comfortable proceeding, who's not. So I think um, we have enough data to proceed. Um, I might just do balloon sizing during the procedure just to be able to give us some comfort regarding the size of valve you choose. Khaled, so just along that choice, are you, are you comfortable with the data? Yeah, I, I think we have enough data to make a, a sizing and we can choose based on that which valve we would use. So I'll start with the first question. So when your sizing is not perfect, does that affect your choices? I.e., you have a bad CT, there's a lot of motion, you're not fully comfortable in your annulus measurements. Do you tend to favor balloon expandable versus self-expanding when they're, you know, when, when the pictures aren't perfect confidence or the, the, the area. So you're getting 
an area, but you don't know. There's a lot of motion, breathing, old patients. We get those a lot. They, they, they're, the quality is not great. It depend on the numbers that you get. So if you have a, a size on the edge of a certain valve, usually it is in the sweet spot of the other valve. So you choose the valve that your, your measurement is in the middle. So even if there is plus minus, it's still you're in the safe place. I would choose it based on that. And then uh, what seems so platform. So this is a small annulus. So this is, you were talking about, if we're in the sapien, it would be 20, 23 on the evolute sizing, LVOT, calcium, kind of, do you have a strategy in how you pick in small annuli or presence of LVOT calcium valve choice? So um, usually my choice is to go with um, a self-expanding valve, usually a supraannular uh, orifice usually helps us better. So that's what I'm usually tending towards. And um, in this case, when we're not very sure about the sizing with the self-expanding, I think we can recapture and always change in case we have to from, uh, from a size standpoint. Yeah, I mean the one thing I would say is sometimes sometimes when they're when they're the they, when you don't have, your data is not so great self expanding is a little more forgivable with sizing you choices. Mean, you mean recapturable? Uh, Reca yeah. some, something so, in terms of the sizing because yeah. of, because it's self expanding because the balloon if you if you're wrong, that's it. <laughs> it's too late, no especially second. when you have LVOT calcium. But when you're you know yeah. this one is not, I don't think is a borderline sizing, but sometimes. I've, uh, when we have borderline sizing and there's a lot of motion, we can't get another set of pictures or whatever. Um, and, uh, and you're between at least in the, the uh, self-expanding, sometimes can be a little bit more forgiving in your, in your size, size choice. But I, I agree with Usim. It's, this is a small annulus, yeah. 270, with a very high calcium LVO2 calcification. I think it's safer to go with a, a self-expandable, no doubt. Anybody think differently? Or have other thoughts? Because if you have to do, to do balloon expandable, we'll go with size 20, which, which we abandoned a long time ago. Uh, <clears throat> a great uh, choice for self-expanding. But I think the what I get worried about always when I go uh, in my therapy cases, having this uh, ambiguity about the CT scan. I think uh, for me as an operator, when I plan my case, I need all the information. In fact, even the choice of my uh, platform is depending on the patient and the CT scan rather than the other way around. But I agree with you, you have two features so far in the CT scan, even if it was not contrast CT scan to push you towards self-expanding, you have sub calcification at the annulus that extends to the LVI throat rack. A lot of calcification in the aorta and a small, small annulus. So that's a, that's a and, good and choice. And no issues with coronary hide or anything that would I did not pick them. Uh, that's that's another whole worry is that we did not know if the TE, 3D TE, we explored initially in, in my previous uh, center, the 3D TE, and it actually gives you a bit of a good information, but I'm not sure about the length of the left main. Is it as adequate as a, as a CT scan? Uh, so well, we got on seat. So this, go, Emma, can, you, can we go back to the slides? This was, I mean, I, I rarely seen a non-con be so good, but this is a, a really, she must have really held her breath very well um, on this non-con. Yes, and about how confident were you on these coronary um, measures? Based on this height, any platform could definitely be used, but as, as you mentioned, the small annuli favor a, a, a self-expanding platform. What we can see here is non-contrast CT. You, c you get lots of information from it. You can clearly see the left main, the height. So can be used. Right, I think we were fortunate in this case that the distribution of calcium was actually more annular than leaflet. It was at the bottom of the leaflet, so that kind of helped us estimate or guesstimate where the annulus would be. But uh, I agree with the concerns about this is obviously not a, an optimum study to make um, conclusive decisions, but it's all about the comfort zone, I would say. Um, <clears throat> so uh, amazing points Can brought up. Um, one, one point before you go, Khalid. Can we get you to comment as the echo guy on 3D annulus sizing? Khaled Brusli. Khaled Brusli. The question is for you, Khaled. <laughs> so the question is, how can the 3D help you in sizing the annulus and the height of the left mean? Because I know we have Ahmed Bafa that he is always very confident in his measurements, but how, how confident are you with your, with your measurements on that? Uh, with regard to the sizing, um, we have experienced before 
in the beginning where we are doing TE for every patient before, and then we can judge which size go goes with that, whether it is by 2D or it is by 3D. The uh, coronary uh, height uh, by 3D, um, there is reasonable uh, experience as well as accuracy, uh, but uh, this is, depends on the image quality and uh, the reproducibility of measuring because even there is an uh, algorithm that it, it, it gives you the height of the coronary left main from the valve, but the uh, resolution is not the same way as, as in the CT. So we can get, like I mean, for example, if it is more than 10 or millimeter or something like that, but sometimes it's very wishy-washy. Uh, may I ask from your experience, <clears throat> usually the TEE areas are less or more than the CT contrast if you want to make a direct comparison from the cases you came across, um, if you have such data. Um, it's, it's because this is a blurry, mm. uh, the resolution sometimes, especially in the 3D, uh, I have, it, uh, have seen more or less because the valve also blurry, mm -hmm. and then the height starting from where exactly, mm -hmm. it's uh, on a rough surface. So you'll have a couple of millimeters less or more mm -hmm. on either sides, but at least gives you an idea. If it is, for example, safe to say this is high enough, mm -hmm. uh, this is possible, but mm -hmm. accuracy in terms of measurements uh, by millimeter, Challenge. maybe not. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, amazing points. Uh, obviously, uh, we're blessed these days to have access to different platforms, uh, different deployment mechanisms, a different location of leaflets. Um, we all build up our own way of doing things eventually. There's no right or wrong. Uh, but as the points highlighted by the panelists and, uh, um, and the audience, LVOT, calcium, small annulus, um, uh, for giving uh, coronary heights, uh, we erred on the side of using a self-expanding bioprosthesis um, uh, which with supraannular leaflet position to, to maximize the hemodynamics um, uh, post-taver. Um, so, you know, continuing on the summary of the case, now we have the anatomical suitability data uh, we felt that this patient um, has reasonably, we're, we're reasonably comfortable with placing an Evolute FX23 size valve in this patient, understanding that we're dealing with dense LVOT calcification, so we are expecting to have some PVL, uh, which we have to be pragmatic about and, and, not, um, and, and make decisions about if we're comfortable leaving it behind us or not. Um, the vascular anatomy, I was honestly speaking less comfortable with than the annular anatomy because I had so many um, points across the vessel, I wasn't sure about it. Um, and uh, that was something, you know, you usually spend a lot of time thinking about ahead of case of, uh, ahead, of ahead of time of the case. I always wanted, I wished we got a CT scan, but that I was less comfortable about the vascular anatomy than the cardiac anatomy based on the data I had. Uh, but overall, we decided to uh, proceed. Um, I think this is a good pause to discuss what steps can we use, not necessarily in this case, but in any Tavar case across the audience, the panelists, uh, what's your uh, contrast uh, mitigation measures, I would say, in your cases? What, what do you usually utilize? <clears throat> so um, I think mainly... Um, Pre-procedure planning is definitely the number one step is to be able to minimize the contrast use. And during uh, the procedure, what we're trying to do is actually trying to cross the valve to get everything tucked in before we start getting the proper angle that we want for angulation, just to minimize the contrast pre and procedure. Because the, the fewer steps we have between the time we uh, lock in our coplanar view or our uh, cusp overlap view and the time of implantation, the less time we have to re-image. Mm -hmm. We use two pigtails. So we have the angulations from the CT already there. So with the, we, in the three cusp view, we put one in none and one in the right, and then line them up the, uh, to be uh, uh, lined up. Then when we go to the cusp overlap view, we put both into the right and left, make sure that they're overlap without injecting any contrast. Um, we might need to do one injection, either in this one or the other uh, angle, five cc's in each 
pigtail, so we don't shoot the root. So we get fairly good images. By that, we have the, uh, the angle, we confirmed it with minimal contrast. And then during the procedure, we make sure the pigtail in place and we are guided by that. Fantastic. Yes, yeah, similar. I would say the biggest for us, the biggest cost, the biggest contrast reduction was going to 50 50 contrast. That was, that was uh, huge. So that's become <clears throat> universal in all our tavers. So because most injections are going to be 5 to 10, full, even full injections will be 20 for 20. So it's that be, be about 10 cc's. And uh, yeah, we do zero pre injections besides the final little puff. And for angulations, go off CT and then cope, you know, get the, get the parallax out of the valve when you're implementing the, to adjust the angle and go with that. Anybody else use anything else for contrast reduction? I think same-sided axis is another, another way. So if you do, you know, for most femoral cases to go same-sided avoids the aortogram or, or if you go opposite side going selective at the end rather than an aortogram is another contrast uh, reduction. This patient has lots of calcium. So you can have, you know, a, a point of reference of the calcium and just exactly. doing deploying right. and position sure. above. I think you can dilute your contrast also, and you can use end hole catheters rather than big tail catheters. They require less contrast and they are more accurate because the big tail, you know, it has certain uh, volume limitation. Yeah, yeah, of course. Excellent points. Okay, Ahmed. Perfect. Um, so, you know, one, one other method, obviously we mentioned the diluted contrast as appropriately mentioned. Uh, we like to use DSA for our vascular angiography to minimize the amount of contrast we give per shot. And also one decision point we had to make in this patient is that if we are going to evaluate for PVL without actually giving contrast, then we definitely need a, a more than a transthoracic echo, in which case transthoracic echo would be extremely important to minimize the amount of contrast we usually give at the end of the post-deployment. Um, it becomes a matter of comfort to the anesthesia colleagues. Uh, do they prefer doing this under general anesthesia if the TE probe will be there or they think that uh, or just simple MAC probe in and out kind of scenario. It depends more on their comfort than us as a uh, interventional cardiologist. But um, these are all things uh, we, we actually prepared for uh, going into the case. Go back to the slides. Here we go. Um, so now uh, with the, the final conclusion of all this um, detailed analysis of the case, clinical imaging data, is that we decided to proceed with the MAC anesthesia, TEE in and out uh, 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 setup. Uh, primary axis, we felt more comfortable about the left hemorrhoid artery. <clears throat> uh, she did have relatively smaller vessels. So we didn't want to use ipsilateral axis because usually you face difficulties with the pigtail then, advancing the pigtail if you have the, sh the, the valve and the pigtail in the same vessel. Secondary axis was right femoral. Uh, and uh, we used the TEE uh, for evaluation of PVL post deployment. And the contrast was 50% diluted. So these were the measures we uh, uh, took. Um, now, uh, you know, now it's, I think it's a good time to discuss um, Evolute FX advantages in this case. Uh, um, a, a lot of experienced operators here, um, especially with the um, Evolute platform. Um, to, to us, you know, knowing the FX is recently released in the region, um, the differences that I felt personally as an operator, obviously the, the gold markers that they have three millimeters above the inflow. So that makes, um, uh, it gives you more a visual feedback about your uh, depth of deployment and your commissural alignment, especially the commissural alignments, because it removes some kind of, removes the element of guessing sometimes, and it gives you uh, solid uh, visual markers to, uh, to actually try to achieve. Um, they removed one of the spines in the shaft, so that the, the actual shaft is, becomes more deliverable, more flexible, especially across the arches and tortuosity. That's something you actually can feel. And overall, the capsule and the nose cone are more, uh, more in line with each other and they have a smoother transition, so going across the vessels. Uh, one difficulty I had in previous cases, especially with the valve and valve, is that the nose cone with the Evolute sometimes gets stuck 
on the older biprosthesis valve. So um, I'll be curious if I come across a case where we need to do a valve and valve with the FX uh, to see what that transition is actually mixed uh, crossing the failed by prosthesis easier or not. These are the things that the FX brings uh, to the table compared to the older generation. When it comes to sizing, it's pretty straightforward, the same. And they provide this nice um, table about what to do if you need to post dilate across different um, annular sizes and perimeters. Uh, using a semi-compliant balloon or a non-compliant balloon, what are the sizes you have to go? Mostly a simple way to memorize it is just by going by the native annulus diameter. You average it out, try to go with the semi-compliant one-to-one, -one, not bigger than that. With the compliant, you actually prefer to undersize. So this is a nice table um, we can use also for decision making. Now into the procedure itself, um, this is the first uh, uh, contrast injection we gave, obviously in the patient, that's the main access site. Um, uh, looking at this vessel here, I think one, uh, one technical pause we can do is um, uh, what's our usual practice these days? Most of us use one pair close or two, uh, or there's any things you look for uh, to make that decision. So we're still using two pre-close, although there's, I think there's a lot of data about one and uh, using an angio seal if needed, especially in the, sm the smaller patients, probably with smaller vessels. We still use two proglites. Um, we don't necessarily close both at the end of the procedure. It depends on the size of the vessel. If the vessel is small, we try to get away with one, um, but we still use two proglites as default. Yeah, so I, I used to, we switched to one about three years ago, um, for most cases, except the really high BMIs. And then I used to always do angioseal. And then Ahmad came and taught me that actually, I, I didn't realize you can do a per close once you have a second per close on top of a per close. So that's what we kind of moved to. Um, this is our, we always get hemodynamics pre and post, uh, just give us a lot of wealth of information. Um, the patient's grade is in the 40s, the mean grade is in the 40s. Uh, we, we noticed that the end diastolic pressure is, is, is pretty low, less than 40, uh, but the patient didn't really have aortic regurgitation to start with, so um, most likely it's just the, the way the patient's pressure is. Uh, her end diastolic pressure, um, we always keep an eye on that, was between 10 and 20, uh, I would say. Um, I guess another technical pause we have here, uh, would we pre-dilate based on the information they have, the CT scan that we have, the gradients, the calcium distribution, our uh, size um, concerns, uh, would we pre-dilate here or, and why? What balloon would you use? Because of the calcium, uh, I would pre-dilate with small balloon, 18 I would choose, but I would pre-dilate. I think the same thing, especially with the uh, without a CT with contrast before. I still prefer to predilate. So um, yes, we did predilate. I just want to show this. Um, we still do this even with the Evolute X to confirm that the crimping was fine. Um, I just want to highlight that there's that that's the spine. There's only single spine on one side um, of the shaft rather than two. So that's the point they were mentioning with the FX. <coughs> um, we pre-dilated with a 20 crystal, uh, basically, and unfortunately here the calcium distribution is not that obvious, but um, um, it was actually helpful knowing where the calcium is um, and actually give us a, some kind of fluoroscopic landmark where the annulus would be. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, the BAV per se was uh, uneventful. <coughs> Uh, and then the usual steps that we all use um, um, for commissural alignment, uh, there's an uh, emphasis on that. Um, these are the steps that even before the FX came out, um, you, you put uh, the side port to three o'clock. Um, you you want to make sure that the hat is the outer curve. And then when you go to your cusp overlap, um, uh, usually the hat is on the uh, center front. Uh, now, what does the FX add to this usual routine that we all do? Um, it's just those those um, radio opaque markers, the gold the gold markers that we have at the commercial sites. Um, just one notice here. Obviously, th th we're early in the experience with our uh, FX. Um, uh, usually, with the Evolute Pro Plus, um, we're, we're used to start somewhere mid pigtail. 
but as we started using more of the Evolute FX, we, we kind of realized that the valve doesn't really dive as much uh, as the older generation. So usually we, we started now in the more recent cases we started doing, um, we positioned the valve somewhere closer to the bottom of the pigtail rather than the middle of it. Uh, this is our cusp overlap view. Uh, we see the pigtail is in the non um, and we remove, we try to remove the parallax from the valve. And uh, here, this is this is an example, not in our patient. Unfortunately, our patient, we didn't store that floral. Uh, but you're supposed to have two dots uh, where uh, where the commissures meet between the non and the right, the non and the left. So you're supposed to have two dots here and one dot on the opposite side, because the opposite side has only one commissure, which is between the right and the left. So two on the left, one on the right of the screen, that's on the cusp overlap view. <coughs> and then once you're comfortable with the depth on your cusp overlap view, you swing to the LAO side as, as we routinely do. And here you see the opposite. You see the two dots on the right of the screen and one dot on the left of the screen, because here you're isolating the left leaflet. Um, as we see here, the green one is the left leaflet being isolated alone. And here is the non on the right. And that's why you have two dots here, which is the uh, commissure between the left and the right and the left and the non. And you have one dot here somewhere hidden here behind the pacemaker. And this is when you swing LAO to isolate your left leaflet. And then here, <coughs> we, we took one shot to just um, evaluate just before we release the valve. So this is basically our second shot of contrast. Um, uh, so far after the left groin shot, this is our second shot. Uh, of contrast, um, and we were happy with, first of all, we, we, we kind of felt comfortable that this was the correct size of valve based on the way the flora and angio looks like. Uh, and we were comfortable with that there's not a lot of leak happening uh, around the 80% deployed valve. Uh, this is just to highlight the deployment, which was a very smooth and slow deployment. Um, I kind of put the line as a visual marker to show that really the valve didn't really um, move forward um, uh, in this patient. <coughs> Very slow deployment. We, we usually like to remove the pigtail uh, before we fully release the valve. We do it under rapid pacing. And that's the valve being fully deployed now there. And. And this was our final hemodynamics. Uh, great uh, result when it comes to residual gradient. There's none. And the LVEDP remains stable. And the uh, end diastolic pressure was still close to 40. So whenever we see such low end diastolic pressure, we always want to make sure uh, that there's no significant leak. And at which case, we asked our um, anesthesia colleagues to put the probe back in and evaluate for the leak. Uh, as we expected where that cal LVOT calcium was, uh, we see that the leak is predominantly there. <coughs> and now the question becomes, uh, based on the current result and what we have so far achieved, um, who would post-dilate this? I, I don't think, I mean, with uh, this, with this minimal or near zero gradient and trace PVL, I don't think there's any indication for post-dilatation in this patient. Mm -hmm. Definitely I wouldn't post-dilate, excellent result. Right, we, um, that was also the agreement in the case. Obviously, we had this discussion, me, Mahmoud, and our surgical colleagues. Um, usually, we have those discussions as a matter of formality. We need to ask that question. We kind of all know the answer, but we just have to put it out there. So um, we decided not to post dilate, knowing that the LVOT calcium can um, bite us back. <clears throat> in case we needed to post dilate, it's nice to have this uh, table right now provided to tell us exactly what size balloon to use. And um, this is the final angiogram. So this is our basically um, third shot, third ang third contrast load. Um, we obviously see that there's a pinch in the vessel and that's even with one per close. So that kind of basically, um, you know, highlights the value of not doing routine two per closes, I would say. Um, in this case, we used one, she was a thin lady and we were comfortable that we were gonna recognize any bleeding uh, immediately, if it happens, nothing will be hiding um, in the soft tissue. Uh, Post-procedural course, um, basically total contrast is between 10 to 15 cc's, um, probably even less if you count the dilution. Uh, she had stable renal function as we see with the cariad being stable, discharged uh, home after three days of monitoring the kidney function, and she continues to follow us with the clinic. Um, 
conclusion. We, uh, the more we do TAVRs, the more we're going to come across patients with their own unique set of uh, uh, challenges. It's always good to keep an open mind and ask your colleagues about what they would do if they were in your position. That's something I learned um, across my uh, early career. Um, it's good to know that there are ways to minimize contrast load, either by dilution, TE imaging, and um, using DSA and sef uh, several different techniques. Um, we also emphasize the procedural techniques, the usual techniques of achieving commissural alignment and optimizing valve deployment, understanding that the FX does add some advantages over the older generation uh, evolutes. So, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. So Khaled, you've used some FX. Obviously, it's hard to do head-to-head, -head, right? Because you're using FX and you didn't use, in the same case, a Pro Plus or, 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 or a R or whatever previous generation. But have you noticed that this sheath made a difference? Does it seem like it makes a difference? Have you been able to navigate more difficult tortuosities than you did before? Yeah, definitely the um, FX is more flexible. There's no doubt about it. The nose cone, which is really tapered, easier through to go through the to the groin and easier to cross the valve. We have noticed that. The other thing is the stability of the valve during the pro deployment. It became more predictive, and you're more confident about your depth with the, those dots. Less recapturing, basically. And less recapturing. So, uh, you know, when you deploy the valve uh, with the Pro Plus, it tend to dive, as Ahmed said. Um, here it's, you know, it's, it's really stable valve. So, so there is big difference between both. Excellent presentation. I just want to comment uh, for the non-contrast CT, basically for the peripheral cases, sometimes, as you said, it's like there is a calcium, you can't like tell exactly are you comfortable or not. Um, IVIS is very helpful. And I don't know if anyone, you know, if you guys use IVIS or not. I've tried it once. It was, it was not nice to use peripheral IVIS, I mean, in that peripheral case, IVIS. but... You know, then you've committed. So you have to kind of, you're in the case. Do you do it routine pre or? Not routine, but just. Like I mean, and for these cases, would you use it pre, pre as a separate case in your planning case? Like, like a CO2 would be done or something like that. That's excellent points, yeah. Um, I, I think the issue with the renal, uh, you know, impairment, not necessarily permanent. Uh, we, we face it in some of the, our patient tabby. Like in the last, say, maybe five or 10 years, we had two patients who ended by having temporary dialysis before their discharge and they picked up their kidney come back. And I think it's a very important uh, matter. Regarding the FX and our uh, uh, experience, I said, let me try it. When, when we had it for the first time, we were doing subclavian. I said, that's the right time, let's <laughs> use it. And I was amazed, to be honest with you, even with the subclavian, it was very stable in comparison with our long experience with core generation till we reached to the propolis. Uh, the second case with FX was uh, um, an, an valve and valve and a failed uh, uh, intuity. And it actually, it did a great job. And we were so happy with the positioning. Yeah, so you're used to the, you have to, that habit of you're used to pulling back as first operator, you got to kind of curb that because it just stays where, where it goes um, uh, from an anatomy. Was it, do you think this is going to make a difference, commissure alignment, you know, um, compared to the old, just, you know, standard, I presume we're getting good commissure alignment or I think being able to see it better? Probably it will. And it's definitely necessary because um, the newer generation, those patients will get probably myocardial infarction, other diseases. And the importance of commissure alignment is very important because for the non-structural uh, trained uh, cardiologists, they, it, we have to make it easier for them to be able to access those vessels and intervene when needed. I'm just curious about the, uh, the audience's experience with uh, Evolute FX. Uh, ha have you come across a case you had to use a 34 device? Have you noticed the difference between uh, the Evolute Pro Plus 34 and the FX 34? Any comments about um, the 34 size specifically? Yeah, I was amazed to be honest. Uh, I used the uh, FX. I, I used the FX actually yesterday, mm. uh, comparing to previous. Uh, 
uh, try of uh, the old uh, 34 is way more stable, way more uh, deliverable, like easier to deliver. Mm. Radial force somehow is better, in my opinion, to be honest. It's opened very nicely and stayed where exactly where I stayed. I didn't do anything. I just mm. opened the valve and stayed where it is. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. I think we're over by 30 seconds. So we're being asked to wrap up the session. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.